So a couple of months back, I put out a video talking about the best budget equipment you can use for real estate videography and photography. But something that I haven't done and I've wanted to do for a while is show you all the gear that I actually use every time I go on site to a house. I'll talk a little bit about the whys behind what I use and what I use certain things for. So let's get started. What's good everybody, Ken here. You're watching Original Dobo. Today's video, we're gonna go over all the gear that I use when I go on site to a home to shoot real estate videos or do photography. Now, this kit is going to be a heck of a lot more expensive and some of the components in this kit are getting ready to be upgraded and I'll explain the reasons as to why I'm upgrading them here in just a bit. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into it. So let's go ahead and start off with the camera or should I say cameras? I like to shoot my real estate with two different cameras. Each camera has its own intended purpose. For instance, the camera that I'm filming on right now is my Sony a7 III. And when I initially purchased this camera, it was not meant to be for video whatsoever. I had two a6400s that stayed in the studio basically nonstop. And then I had my a6600 and an a6100 that I took on site to home. So a total of four cameras. I've since then sold my a6400s in lieu of the a7 III, and I use a, a 6600 as well. So for photos, I use the a7 III, but in my YouTube studio, I do use the a7 III for video. I know it sort of sounds counterintuitive to think that I wouldn't use the a7 III for video, but I'll talk more about that here in a moment. For the better half of a year, I have used this. This is the a6600, uh, and basically ever since it's come out, I've had it and I've used it. Uh, for video primarily. The reasons why I love this uh, camera for video is because the color profile, to me, it's pretty damn good. It's basically the same as the A6400, which got a massive improvement over the A6500 and the A6300. It's got in-body image stabilization, although it's not the best, it definitely, it definitely is better than nothing, I guess, best way to put it, especially with half the lenses that I use do not have IBIS built in. The other big reason why I love this camera is because the battery on this uses the new Sony Z batteries, which means you're gonna get a lot of battery out of this. I can film two to three houses with this camera before I ever have to swap batteries, which to me is, is awesome and you honestly couldn't trade that for the world. The EVF is also pretty damn bright and so is the back screen. It's, it's really bright out in sunlight, which is a big win. Also, the ergonomics of this camera are far better, and the autofocus on this is really, really super precise, which makes it a great video camera. Now, when I use the Sony a6600, I typically will pair it with, I'll say one of two lenses, but there is a third lens, but it's more of an optional thing. So the first lens I do use, and this was in my budget kit, is the 12 millimeter Samyang uh, lens, which I use this still today, and it works incredibly well. However, I have stopped really using this a lot and primarily when I'm outside because when this thing gets sun flares, it really, really reduces a immense amount of contrast and sometimes it's almost too much to actually correct in post. So because of that, I've, I've stopped using this a lot outside, but it's a great beginning lens and it's a lens that I can definitely recommend if you're on a tight budget. The lens that I do the primary amount of my video work with when I do use the 6600 for video is this. This is a Sony 10 to 18 millimeter lens. And when I first bought this lens, I just had the intention that I was gonna use this primarily for photos, but I shifted my mindset a little bit because what I found is as you stop down on the f-stop and go to like f4, f5, and even f6 in video, that video gets a lot sharper. and when you're able to bump the ISO up higher, especially with the Sony cameras where technically there is two separate ISO levels where you can hit and really reduce immense amounts of noise. So with this camera specifically, I can bump the ISO up to 5000 and still have a relatively clean image when I'm filming in 4K. And because of that, that is the reason why I opt to use the 10 to 18 millimeter lens, really sharp image combined with 4K it looks great. Now, some people have also asked me how come I'm using 24 frames per second when I said a couple of months ago I shot 1080p 60. The biggest reason is because we are dealing with an 8-bit codec, 
The 4K files give you much more data to work with. They have a better bit rate at 100 megabits versus the 50, which means that the files degrade a heck of a lot less on these cameras than if I was to shoot at 1080p 60. 24 frames per second also just fits my flow because everything I shoot is 24, which means that I can you know, show examples from videos and not have to worry about them colliding with anything that I shot in 30 frames. This was a problem that I had in earlier real estate videos is because I had an issue with some of my videos were 24 and some of them were 30. So there you go. That's that's the reason why I do that. And the other reason is Sony does crop in on 30 frames per second, at least on these older cameras. So if you want to get the max amount of resolution out of your camera, you're going to want to shoot in 24 frames per second if you're using an a7 III or below. All right, let's put these two lenses off to the side. Let's talk about the full frame lenses that I do use. I'm going to go right for the Tamron 17 to 28 millimeter lens. Now, this lens is probably the best bang for buck budget lens that you can get today on a Sony full frame mirrorless camera. This lens costs $7.99 and you can find them with that gray market special for right around $6.99 and sometimes even less than that. This lens happens to be a gray market lens. Now, what does that mean? Well, technically it doesn't come with the warranty, but I can't say that I've ever had to warranty out a lens, so it's not something I'm really overly concerned about. I was able to update the firmware on this Tamron lens, which if you buy this, definitely, definitely, definitely upgrade the firmware on it because it will stop the hunting and pulsing that this lens suffers from on the earlier firmware versions. Once you get past that, this is a great lens. It works phenomenal for video, but I primarily find myself using this a lot for photo. In photo, 17 to 28 can be a little bit challenging and limiting when you are dealing with smaller homes. But for the most of the houses I shoot, I'm typically at 17 to 20 millimeters on average, and uh, this lens is incredibly sharp. Another mm -hmm. lens that I did pick up to sort of make way for the fact that the Tamron isn't really wide enough, is this, and this is the Samyang 14 millimeter AF full frame lens for Sony. And this is a $500 lens, so combined these are both $1,100. And I guess in theory, if I just decided to buy one lens, I probably would have bought maybe the Sigma 14 to 24, but this gives me definitely a pretty good focal range. And also I bought this first, then this when I had the money. So this lens right here, the Samyang lens, is a really phenomenal lens. I did do a couple of video shoots where I use this specifically just for video with the Sony uh, a7 III for some clients, and I really like the way it looked. So it makes me really excited to replace both of these cameras with the a7S III because that will be my primary video shooter, and the a7 III will just be for photos, and then I'll use my Sony a6600 for when I'm vlogging out and about because this camera is a great vlogging camera and it's super compact. But uh, yeah, this is the 14 millimeter Samyang lens and there was really not a lot out about this lens. I'm gonna go ahead and put up some sample clips and footage from this and uh, yeah, I'm really impressed with it. The corners are really sharp, the images look great. What I love about this is in small bathrooms or small rooms, you can sort of open up the shot without making things look overly distorted or too big, which is a problem that I see a lot of photographers and videographers often have. So great budget lens, can't recommend this enough. And then going back to sort of the APS-C lineup, the last lens that I do use often for detail shots and sort of like those macro shots is the Sigma 30 millimeter F 1.4. This can be used on a full frame camera in crop mode, but this little lens is really great. And what I love about the 30 millimeter is the focusing distance is actually really not bad. I can get about a foot away from a subject and really get those tight, nice out of focus backgrounds and really accentuate whatever it is that I'm trying to film or photograph. So 30 millimeter, it's optional, but I do find myself gravitating towards this lens a lot in homes because it just gives that nice creamy background and uh, it's just really appealing. All right, so we got the cameras out of the way, but what do I use as far as gimbals go? Well, I use the Weebill S, the Weebill. The Weebill will wobble, but they won't fall down. So I've been using the Weebill S back since like early December, maybe since last year. And um, honestly, I wasn't gonna buy a new gimbal because I had the Ronin SE and I was totally satisfied with the SE. I actually had two SEs at the time. And uh, my buddy Sean Brooks from Sean Brooks Media said that he absolutely loved this, it's so versatile, 
And part of me is glad I listened to him, but part of me is also like, damn it, Sean, why did I buy this? Because I, I, I hate it more than I like it, if that makes sense. There's a lot that this gimbal does have going for it, but it's those parts that I hate that just really are deal breakers. In real estate, you want a gimbal to try to be as about as smooth as possible with really no sudden movements. And I often find that this gimbal has a lot, a lot of jerky pan movements. And it's just something that really does bother me because it always happens at the worst possible time. The weight capacity on this is unknown, so I really don't know what the threshold is that this can actually handle, but I will say I have had some incredibly heavy setups on here and it's done great. Now the battery life is really good on this and the fact that it just takes 18650 batteries means that you can change these out relatively cheap and often if you need to. I did go ahead and put a quick release setup on here, which is an Arca Swiss. I'll touch more on why I like to use these Arca Swiss plates here in a moment, but just know that this is gonna make your life really, really super simple if you use a, a uh, tripod with a Swiss plate as well. The last thing that I did do is go ahead and put a permanent grip on here. I used to have it where I would take this bottom piece off and be able to attach it here, but it just got to be a little bit annoying and I felt that one of the things that I hate about this gimbal is the overall ergonomics because you really don't have anywhere to grab without hitting buttons was a little annoying. So having a dedicated handle up top here did go ahead and fix that annoyance for me. Um, but you know, the gimbal to me still has some issues. Like I don't like the locks. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but just know that I do plan on upgrading this gimbal and I will be going with one of the new Ronins once that does come out. All right, let's talk about the flash that I use because I take one flash with me. Anyways, it's the 8200 or the Evolve Pro, or I forgot what uh, Adorama calls it, the Flashpoint. Anyways, it's made by the same company. It's the 200 Pro, and this flash is an absolute beast. I did go ahead and put a pistol grip on here because it makes it really super easy to go ahead and just hold it and point it up at a light or point it up at something white and let it bounce. I also do not use the Fresnel mount. Now this mount here, this is the bare bulb. You can see there's a bulb inside of there. I'll just pull it up to the screen here so you can see it. But there is a bulb in here. And um, yeah, so this is the, this is not the um, stock. I don't know, this is not the stock lens. It doesn't come with this, it doesn't. Um, oh shit. Um, yeah, so this is the, um, bare bulb setup and I find that it renders really good colors for me specifically. And it also gets a little bit more even spread on the flash, especially when you use this sort of diffuser here. I don't have anything on top absolutely ever. Um, it's not a perfect flash by any stretch of the imagination. Sometimes you will find that you have to adjust your white balance, but it is very, very bright and I can cover a good portion of most of these larger rooms with one single flash at max power output. What do I use for the trigger? Well, it's this, this is the X-Pro S and um, you need to have a trigger if you're going to be using uh, the 8200. So these triggers where they mount, they'll mount literally right on top of your camera like so. And then you can control multiple flashes with this trigger. So I have some little mini flashes. If I'm dealing with a really large property, I'll put multiple flashes on stands and set them around the house and then I can control each of them with this trigger. And this trigger is definitely awesome. The battery life is great. I, I, I don't even remember the last time I changed these batteries. Just a little pro tip, if you do get this trigger, do not use rechargeable batteries. For some reason, this thing does not like rechargeable batteries, but if you use just standard batteries, the battery life is absolutely awesome. Okay, let's talk about the tripod because the tripod did make its way into my budget real estate video and it's actually this down here. So no, it's not a Manfrotto tripod. This is the Benro tripod and I also have the Benro gear head on here. And I've been using this for well over a year or so. This is the Mach 3 tripod and quite literally, I've been very haphazard with this, sort of throwing it around and just leaving it in the trunk of my car often. But the gear head works just as great as it did on day one. Nothing's really coming loose. I don't have anything missing on it. It just works and the gearhead makes life really, really super simple when you wanna get those really precise shots to make sure that you are lined up accordingly with all of your verticals and uh, it also has bubble levels on here so 
I can't recommend the Benro tripod more. It is probably my favorite accessory that you just really don't think about when you're doing photography. It does make life simple. It is a little bit heavy. They do make a carbon fiber version, but I honestly have no intention on buying that because this is working just fine. And if it's working, why replace it if it's not broken? Okay, and then the last piece I wanna talk about is the drone that I do use. Now, I know you guys know that I'm a huge Evo fan and I've done a fair amount of bitching about the Mavic 2 Pro and its geofencing. However, with that being said, I still gravitate back to the Mavic 2 Pro for a couple of reasons. Even though this doesn't support 4K60 and it's gonna make me seem like a hypocrite, the color profile and color science that DJI has put into the Mavic 2 Pro is honestly, it's second to none when it comes to GPS uh, drones. It really is. It's probably some of the best color science and D-Log M is probably my favorite color profile to shooting because I can match a multitude of cameras easily with that color profile. I just, I just spit. You probably, maybe you saw that. I don't know. Now, that's not to say that I don't like the Evo 2 Pro. It's just that the color science on this camera versus this, the Mavic 2 Pro is just far superior, at least in log. The other addition is the fact that there is no 10-bit, but in 6K on the Evo 2 Pro just boggles my mind. I can get 4K 60 10-bit, and on this, I can't. And it definitely does show, and it's something that is starting to really piss me off. But... If I am in an area in which I'm gonna have a problem with authorization, I will bring this. It's just gonna take a little bit extra finessing when I get it back to my editor than this does. This is just really super easy. And man, I, I can't say enough good things about this camera. Um, if you can get past the battery issues and the geofencing, this camera is just phenomenal as far as color goes, video, and even photos are just top notch. All right, with that said, I do also use the smart controller and I use the smart controller pretty damn often. The smart controller is probably one of those unsung heroes in my kit because it makes flying a drone outside so much more enjoyable simply because I can see everything. I never have to worry about if my shot was in focus, whether it was exposed properly. It's all right here and the ability to play it back after I shot it just means the smart controller is an absolute must for a real estate videographer or photographer. The last thing you're definitely gonna to wanna to make sure you pick up is a set of ND filters. Even though these cameras do have, for the most part, variable apertures, you do wanna get yourself a set of ND filters because it will make your life easier when you're trying to expose for certain shots, especially using log. And then the very last thing that I never, 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 ever, ever go into a house without anymore after making a absolutely stupid bonehead decision is this, this is a little rocket blower. And this is great, especially if you're like me, you're constantly swapping out lenses when you're on site. You're definitely gonna get dust in your lens at some point and you're gonna wanna be able to blow that off. Do not blow on your lens. I made a stupid decision when I got my A6600 one time, swapping a lens around and I blew on it and I got some spit on the sensor and it caused an eternal spot and I ended up having to get the sensor cleaned. Now you can clean your sensors yourself. It is a bit unnerving to do. It, it's totally safe. Tony Northrup's got a video on it. So does Arthur K. But it's just something that you don't wanna have to do. If you can avoid doing that to your sensor, get a rocket blower, you'll, you'll honestly thank me later. Now I'm sure there's some things that I am missing in this kit, but this is just what I tried to take when I go on site. Now, am I always taking this many lenses? No, I'm not taking this many lenses, not as of late. As of late, I've actually just taken my Sony a7 III and reluctantly swapped my cameras. Hopefully when I do get the a7S III, it will be a7S III for video, a7 III for photos, and the uh, Mavic 2 Pro again for most of my photos. Like I said, it all depends on the area I am in. As much complaining as I do about the Mavic 2 Pro, I still find myself using it quite a bit. Hey, but that's that's life for you. Use whatever is best and there you go. I do I do want to give a huge shout out to Chris who gave me a epic amount of batteries for the Mavic 2 Pro. Honestly, I can't thank you enough, man. You gave me six batteries, six barely used batteries for the Mavic 2 Pro. Honestly, I, I, I can't thank you enough because that was definitely a huge help in trying to keep this thing up in the air as long as I can, especially since this thing's like three years old now. 
But there you go. I'll have a link in the description below where you can check out all of this gear for yourself if you're interested in it. If you have questions about anything that I discussed here, or maybe I didn't make something totally clear on how I use something, let me know. I'll be in the comments section and uh, answering your questions. As always, you can reach me via email. You can also check me out on Facebook. I'm pretty active there as of late and along with Twitter. All right, guys, hope you enjoy and stay original. <laughs>